it like the first thing anything you want to improve at you got to track episode 155 Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Ackroyd Lowry, co-founder and director, Oliver Lowry. Prior to starting Ackroyd Lowry with partner John Ackroyd, Oliver spent 10 years working at Archetype, where he was responsible for developing modular timber frame construction system that was used by several London boroughs to, to deliver new primary schools and nurseries. Oliver studied at Sheffield University for his part one and Oxford Brooks for his part two and completed his training at Westminster in 2012. He regularly lectures on sustainable design at Nottingham University and has tutored at Oxford Brooks. Oliver's work has also been exhibited at the Royal Academy as part of the Urban Utopias exhibition, and he has been published in Blueprint and FX magazine. In this episode, Oliver shares his experience in running a fast-growing architecture practice, how investing in advisors early in the practice has paid itself back many times over, and their approach to nurturing client and contractor relationships, and how they are optimizing every part of the practice and aligning it with their vision of building the cities of the future. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Oliver Lowry. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Oliver, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. Avid listener. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to be here and um, really exciting to be able to see the offices of Ackroyd Lawyery. Um, really amazing story. The business is, as you said just a minute ago, about seven years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Seven years last October, I think. So it's pretty. It's been a pretty rapid growth from you and John founding the company, sitting in a basement in a in a kitchen in Clapton to yeah to here. So it has been it's been quite a, quite an adventure. What was the? How, how did you guys come across with the idea? Because you were both at Archetype previously. Yes. So we both, we met when we were at Archetype, and I think um, we were um, Archetype's an amazing company. Um, for people that don't know it, it's a sort of um, pioneer of sustainability. Um, it's probably been going 40 years. Amazing director there, Bob Hayes, um, who's real, you know, like somebody that I, I look up to. Mm. Um, and I was there around 10 years and John was there around seven years. And, I, you know, we'd sat, we had an amazing time. Um, but I think there was quite a few people above us. It felt like we were in a kind of a, a queue, if you like, for the more senior positions. And both of us being impatient, um, <laughs> felt that we could probably um, branch off and, and, and kind of, we started talking about ideas and I think we also felt that we had, um, sustainability I think needs to be thought about in a city scale, holistic way and yeah. I, I, I felt that Archetype's version of it was too building centric yeah. and we wanted to be more city centric and, and um and so I think that was the thing that, you know, I'm still very excited by. And so that was really where the kind of the ideas around our practice now came from. We wanted to do things differently. We wanted to embrace technology. We wanted to make change at a sort of high level um, by kind of influencing policy as well as, as architecture. And, and so that, you know, that was our kind of, those have been our North Stars, um, uh, you know, how, how you create the cities of the future um, mm. when architects tend to be kind of in a, you know, quite a long way down the pecking order of decision making. And that's that dichotomy that I think we've always um, had at the centre of our practices. You know, how do we punch above our weight? How do we, how do we be influential? Um, so we jumped ship when an opportunity arose. Uh, it was, um, a sort of, you know, some family friends bought a site in Bermondsey and they, um, there's an old warehouse, they got it, uh, uh, just, they saw it on an auction site and it sort of looked like a little two up, two down um, brick terraced house. Uh, and so we went to the open day and there were lots of couples, first time buyers. It was kind of 2008 or 2009, coming out of the financial crisis. Yeah. Um, and lots of little couples there holding hands walked through the front door of this brick two-story building and there was no back of the building. <laughs> it was just a facade. <laughs> and then there was this like 
derelict <laughs> warehouse. It was absolutely amazing. And me and John were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And they put in a, a cheeky kind of pre-auction offer, got it for an absolute steal. Um, and then we secured planning on that um, over the next kind of 12 months while, while still working at Archetype. In, uh, and, and it was only when, so yes, yeah, so that wasn't actually when we jumped ship. Um, that we did kind of in our spare time, you know, twenty pounds an hour, or whatever, on the side. So there's a bit of moonlighting first, kind of. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because it wasn't we weren't working for developers; we were just working for family friends. So yeah, we didn't feel particularly bad about it. Um, and then, I they they we got planning consent for five units, and we said to them, "Sell, don't build this. It's tight, really tight site. It had about twelve party walls, um, and uh, our advice was just sell it." It's going to be a tricky one, and you're not a developer. You're just, you know, just some, some people who who bought a site. So they sold it, got they tripled their money. We then felt a bit mugged off about our twenty pounds an hour that we charged them. <laughs> but um, you know, it all worked out in the end. About six months later, I was on the stag do of a friend of mine, and I got this phone call. This, this guy's like, "Hi, um, did you do the, the planning for?" It was Blue Anchor Lane. Uh, and I was like, oh, yes, what's wrong? <laughs> and he went, oh, nothing's wrong. I've, I've just bought it and, um, you know, I want to uh, build it out. Do you want to do the technical design? And I said, well, I, I don't have a company. And he said, well, why don't you set one up? And so I rang up John and I was like, do you want to set up a company? And so the answer was yes. He handed in his notice. John had sort of just got married so, and he'd just finished a big project. And so it was good timing for him. So he set up the company. I stayed for about six, eight months later to try mm-hmm. and finish off the project that I was working on. Um, and so I was working one day a week here. Uh, you know, we got this, we actually were on the top floor of this building um, and we quite quickly made this our base. And so I was one day a week, I was coming here and like we grew the team quite quickly. We were very fortunate after that first project. So with that first project, we, as I said, we started in a basement kitchen of my flat in Clapton. That was our first office. And the first paycheck, we bought our first laptop. And the second paycheck, we got a printer. And the third paycheck, we got another laptop. It was really like hands to mouth, but so much fun. And then we moved out of the kitchen of, of my flat into, um, into the Three Compasses, which is a pub in Ridley Road, where we knew the landlord there. And so that was our base for, for a few months, which is really quite fun, but dangerous, um, <laughs> being in our, in our late 20s with a pub as an office. Um, and then we, we, a friend of mine rang up and he, he said, uh, my boss is, um, he, I knew that he worked sort of in the film and photographic industry mm. as like a kind of runner and a driver, um, at this company that was, um, called Alva. And, and he said, my boss wants to design a, a photographic studio. I was like, okay, you know, sounds interesting. And so went to meet him and he's one of the most ambitious entrepreneurs I've ever met. And he was like, this is a building. I've got a lease on it for 20 years. I want to spend... I think he wanted to spend three million pounds. I think he spent a bit more than that in the end. Um, and we ended up signing a contract in another pub, the Dolphin, famous uh, sticky floor. I unfortunately know that pub a little bit yeah. too well. Oh, yeah, and I've never actually been there in the daytime, but this was the <laughs> no only one time. Has. We, yeah, it was, so his office is round there, uh, kind of Baker Street. So we ended up signing the contract for about it was about two hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, um, and which was like we never we just it was like more money than me and John could even really imagine at the time. But then that allowed us to hire staff and get you know move into this office so we've started on the top floor of this office Mm. and that was while I was still part-time at Archetype so I was coming in every Friday I had my day in here seeing this growing team we'd all have lunch together we had this amazing vibe you know everyone in their kind of 20s early 30s and then I have to go back to Archetype and be like oh god you know it's like (laughs) like this huge pull and so um yeah, I didn't last very long I I eventually just had it. Amazing amazing that you you did that for what nearly the best part of the year kind of I actually can't remember how long it was. Yeah, it was, well, I really wanted to finish off the project that I was working on, which yeah. is Highgate Junior School for Archetype. Um, and, you know, one, we sort of got that scheme from competition. I'd worked on the competition bid, and by the end I was, mm. you know, me and, me and Bob, the director, were the last men standing who'd started the process. So I really felt like I wanted to get that yeah. over the line. And, um, and John was full-time in, in and the John business. was full-time here, yeah, yeah. So it was like six or eight months. And then eventually I, I contracted. Once I left, I we contracted... I contracted myself back as a freelancer to Archetype to try and get that project finished. Smart. Um, but, what, yeah, I mean, I, in, the, in the end, I think it's the, the snagging of it's probably still going on now. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so that's quite interesting, actually, um, starting the business like that and kind of having a nice crossover period. I know so many architects will jump into the business, they'll leave a job kind of quite abruptly or... You know, they lose a job and start a business, start start a practice, and then there's the kind of 
there's a lot of stress that comes with that. When, and particularly when people leave a job and they've got one project and then the project suddenly halts and then they're in that situation of, oh God, what do we do now? And then it's kind of hand to mouth sort of stuff. And then, then there becomes this pattern of taking on work that's not fit. Um, when, you were, when you were kind of working in both, did you find that actually having a, having a salary gave you quite a lot of confidence to be able to take more risks here or no I wish I'd done it less of the crossover I didn't enjoy it I actually was kind of the most stressful I ever was in my life and right. um, no I think my advice to anybody that was going to start a company is just do it you know you never re- you never understand I never thought like now you know part of what we have to do is sell right we've yeah. got to sell between 180 and 250 thousand pounds worth of work every month right? mm-hmm. I've got to get somebody convince somebody to sign on the dotted line for 250,000, that, that amount that I sat in the Dolphin and signed the first time thinking it was the most unbelievable amount of money, we have to do that every month. Yeah. And, um, you know, you'll never, you never understand that you're going to be good at it until you're sat there and you're like, oh my God, if I don't win some work, I'm not going to get paid. I can't pay my mortgage. I can't pay yeah. rent, whatever. You know, like, it's the greatest motivator and you find that you're like, I never thought I was good at it. And now I think I probably am quite good at sales and I've, I've done it quite a lot, but... I never knew that I was good at it until I had to do it. And yeah. you'd only have to do it if you don't have a salary. So I wish I'd just pulled the Band-Aid off quicker. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think we managed to keep good relations with Archetype and you know, still in contact with the director, Bob, and, um, and Ben, the current director. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that we made the effort. And, and none, none of what we did was sneaking around behind anyone's back. I think we were very open about, about you know, our, our, the growth of this, this new business. Um, and we're really, you know, a lot of what we do is quite kind of trying to carry on the legacy of what, what, what we were doing at Architect and there's real continuity. So in that regard, I'm glad that we, that, that I was able to sort of get, you know, the project I was working on to a point where I felt like it was okay to leave. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it was much, once I was here, I was happier. Yeah. I was able to, you know, engage properly in what I was meant to be doing. And I don't think you can, you can't think of all the challenges that you're going to have to overcome when you're immersed in somebody else's series of challenges and problems. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, the, the value and the worth of a company is, is the combination of all the problems that you've managed to, to, to successfully overcome and solve. And, you know, you need your brain in it 100% to be able to work out even what the problems are and yeah. then work out the solutions to them. So it's interesting then, so seven years later, how big is the, the team? Uh, 30 now. 30. Yes. And, and what was that um, process like from going from that 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 one contract of two hundred thousand pounds to having to do that every month. Um, well, a lot of stuff happened in the middle, obviously. But um, so I think the the thing that was most significant for us is you know we were both reasonably young, relatively young when we started it, um, and I think that we have always paid for lots of advice as a result. Mm-hmm. And I think more architects should do this. And you know any investment that you pay out in getting somebody to tell you stuff that you don't know always pays itself back many, many times over. So I think by the second year, we were doing 350 grand a year or something like that. And uh, I joined this entrepreneurs network called the Suffer Club. And the, um, the format is, I don't know if it still is like this because of COVID, but the format was you went to like a private member's room and once a month and you'd meet with kind of like-minded, you'd pick a topic. So it was, they did it every week, but you'd pick the topic that was most interesting to you. So I think I went to this one that was about, you know, leadership or advertising, whatever it was. And you sit around the table, you listen to these eight other entrepreneurs all sort of tell their pain points. And it's kind of loosely chaired by the person from the supper club. And at the first one, everyone kept going, non-exec this, non-exec that. And I was like, Hi there. Very sorry. What what the fuck's a non-exec? And um, they were like, "What? You don't know what a non-executive advisor is?" I was like, "No." I, you know, make me feel even worse about this. And they were like, the girl from the supper club was like, "Don't worry. You know, I'll get a list over to you tomorrow." And so she put forward a few candidates. Um, one of whom was um, a tech entrepreneur who d- built and sold a company, which mm-hmm. is it was bought by Trimble, which is SketchUp. So um, he'd sold in. He'd sold into architects. He'd sold. He'd gone into every architect's office in in the UK, pretty much, and sold. Tried to sell them this environmental modelling software. So it was sustainability software for a guy that knows about architecture, but also knows about tech. Yeah. And he just exited his business and was looking for roles. And we were like, Oh my yes. God! <laughs> praise be. This is exactly what we want. So, and we, you know, managed to convince him that we were worth. I think we were the first non-exec role that he 
done. So we were probably like his guinea pigs, his practice. You know, I thought he, I think he thought that if it, if it didn't go very well, it wouldn't really matter because it wasn't really where he wanted to go. Um, but he was our non-exec for. for yeah, so, so four just five for years. Um, people who might not know what the non-exec, how would you describe the role of a non? non-exec well there's non-exec director and that's something very different and that's got comes with some responsibilities a non-executive advisor is just you just a gun for hire it just gives you advice um he so what what the you know the two things that so this guy's called mads jensen and and mads um firstly it formalized our board process because before that we'd been pretty um ad hoc in, in terms of having a board and the reason like we still do it now monthly board meeting um, regardless of if we have anybody attending, now our accountant comes because he's our sort of, you know, FD effectively, and we have a non-executive uh, advisor now, Mark Hallett, who's um, uh, at Igloo um, Development, um, and he, he's an our sort of, you know, new, new non-exec advisor. But the point of forcing yourself to meet every month is mm. that you have to print out your P&L. So the, we go through this process with our accountant where we go, how much sales have we got this month? What's our, you know, what's our revenue? What's our outgoings? What's our profit or not? Um, it just forces you to take that moment in time to go, oh shit, we need to course correct here. You know, yeah. we've got a problem here. We've either got too much stuff or not enough stuff. You know, <laughs> fundamentally, those are the two main problems. Um, or, you know, what's our strategy? Now we're much more strategic. So it's January at the time of recording this and we're planning out our strategy for 2022. And that's, you know, that the board is now quite sophisticated in terms of what we do. Mm-hmm. But at the start, it was just sitting down with Mads and him looking through our P&L for the month and going, guys, you've got a problem here. You know, you're working in progress or whatever is too high or your debtor days are too high or clients paying too slowly effectively with <laughs> the perennial problem of architects. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the first, you know, the, the one the huge advantage was of, of having Mads was one, we had a board meeting. So we were able to constantly take stock, reevaluate where we were and course correct. The second thing was that he was very ambitious. He was like, God, this architecture industry is pretty crazy. You know, he was like, so your revenue is 320 or 350. And, and we sort of, when we pitched to him, we were like, we want to have 20% growth this year, Mads. He was like, his, his lovely accent that he has, he goes, so, so, uh, what if I was to say <laughs> that you should have 100% growth? We're like, shut up, Mads. Like, what, you know, well done. Like, we're paying whatever, <clears throat> 1,500 pounds a day for you. Is this your insight? You're just like double your turnover. And he was like, well, you know, go think about it. So we came back the next board. We put together a plan of how, you know, what would we have to do mm. to do uh, to do 600 or 700 grand the next year? And Mads is like a champion of this good strategy, bad strategy. So what you do is you go, well, the, the, you know, this is my objective is to try and double my revenue. What are the obstacles to that growth? We go, okay, well, I don't have enough work you know i don't haven't got the highest paying jobs or the best jobs coming in that are going to be you know either i'm going to have to load more jobs or i'm going to have to do jobs that are higher paying either way those are two strategies for for how you would achieve that what is the obstacle to getting those well it's that you currently don't aren't connected to the right people and they don't know who the fuck you are right the the kind of things along those lines and then you've got the second joke well how would you deliver that you don't yet have sufficient competent staff at that point to be able to deliver that because mm-hmm. mostly it was like me and John director leading you know we were kind of being directors and also the project architects so so you're like okay well so we need to improve the way that we win work and then we need to improve the way that we deliver work um, and lo and behold over the next 12 months we got our revenue up to 700,000 like literally doubled our revenue because Mads had challenged us to work out if we were going to make that our target how we would do it yeah and then since then we've been pretty good uh, I think what Mads really taught us to, <clears throat> to do was go, well, what's the, what's the challenge? You know, wh- where do you want to be? And what's the che- what are the three main obstacles that are going to prevent you from getting there? Mm. Then diagnose how you might overcome those things and then put into place policies that will overcome those challenges. So, so in that first year of 100% growth, what were some of the specifics that you were doing to, and what were some of the specific obstacles that you, that you faced well, it's, like, it's just winning work and delivering it, really, isn't it? I mean, it still is. I think our challenges for 2022, we've just put down, are just, you know, they're just variations of the same things that yeah. we've been <clears throat> talking about. They're just at a bigger scale. Um, so, you know, it's the sophistication of how you win the work and then the sophistication of how you deliver it efficiently. We also, we like to work very fast. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons that people like working with us. So, what, you know, our challenge for this year, because we're sort of like, I think we can deliver stuff. 
um, and we can deliver it really fast, but it's often a bit uncomfortable for the people that you know that aren't used to our pace. So um, our challenges for this year going forward are how we comfortably deliver stuff at pace. So you know, and, and that's uh, as much as it's like we're very invested in our staff's well being. Mm-hmm. But most of that, you know, the stuff around the sides, <clears throat> having a good culture in the office, making sure that people are, you know, looking after their mental health and well-being. If you just are going to really s- s- whip them to deliver projects really hard without the proper resourcing, that's the main problem. So it's like, how do you make right. sure that the briefing is correct so that people aren't going off and doing the wrong work? That's yeah. the stuff that actually your inefficiency is mostly caused by by lack of briefing. It's, it's not that there's not enough hours to do the task. It's that often people are doing a slightly different task for the one that's needed. Yeah. So it's better briefing. And we've got like a, we've built this intranet um, and kind of education process. So it's, on, it's called the AL Academy. And it goes from the moment you start um, here at the practice, you get onboarded into the way that we work. Mm-hmm. And we've got sort of, you know, this internet has all these different videos, firstly, to kind of introduce people to the topics and te- teach people how we do stuff. And then it has, uh, you know, our kind of central thing is it's got this tracker, which has a lot, you know, all the information that you're going to need, hopefully, to be able, if I died tomorrow, all the projects that I'm working on, hopefully the information should be in the tracker and the people yeah. should be able to just carry on. So it's kind of like a, a process roadmap, if you like, yeah. of, of all of the different systems inside of the business. Exactly. And- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Um, and so that's that's our you know our challenge this year is like around efficiency and making sure that it's enjoyable to work at this mm-hmm. pace and that starts from hiring so really you know we've, one of the things we've done recently is a staff handbook about what it's like being here and who we want to hire not everybody's going to work you know if you've been working at and we've hired lots of people that have worked at some of the bigger practices yeah. where I think either you blend into the background or you're not confident to to just take control of situations mm-hmm. when it's a very uncomfortable landing coming and working here. Yeah. Because after the first, you know, I expect to put, the, our, on page three of our staff handbook, it says, it doesn't matter what role you are in this company, you are the architect. Yeah. And it, it, I, you know, the, we've got a part one this year, Ben and I, you know, went out and had some drinks all together on the first week and, and I was like, how's it going? And I, you know, he's like, oh, all my friends are doing window schedules and I seem to be designing a whole building. And I was like, yes, you are the architect. <laughs> From now on, you are, <clears throat> you know, um, in this practice, we want everybody to, to feel like they, they are the architect. Architects are responsible for communicating, delivering, <coughs> understanding, you know, and then expressing. And, and, and we want everybody that joins to, to feel mm. that they are the architect. And going back to this idea of, of training your team members with the, on, on an onboarding process and developing this process roadmap, if you like, um, what you, the internet mm-hmm. sort of your education AL Academy the AI Academy AL AL Academy sorry um, how you know, how did that come about like how did you, was that was that something that the, the non-exec <coughs> suggested or was that something that you guys were no that that was us um, so Mads was with us until probably uh, halfway through COVID uh, first struck so 2020 um, yeah COVID happened in March and once the board meetings um, were virtual, I think we felt like we weren't getting quite as much input from him as we had been before. So, and I think he was, you know, probably done with us after five years. He, he, look, it's not we're not really in his sector, so he's he's um, it does sort of tech investments mostly. Yeah. So he's, you know, his we think it's amazing to double our revenue in a year. He's interested in things that are going to, do, you know increased by 10 times every year yeah so we were a bit small for I think well we were <clears throat> anyway we've got somebody within the we've got Mark Hallett now who's within our industry which I think makes a lot more sense um, but no so this was something that we came up with on our own and it was actually a direct result of Covid <clears throat> because we were pretty much the only company that was hiring mm. not the only company but we, we we hired 10 people between you know March 2020 and and the kind of the March 2021 um, and we, so it was amazing for us. We had the pick of the market. Because I have sort of fifty percent increase in in the team. Uh, not quite, but yes, it was. So we pro- we started COVID with probably fifteen people, and right. we, we we you know when did it end? I don't know. We're thirty now, but so we've, you know we've doubled since the start of that. Um, but a lot of that was during lockdowns, and so we I think you know we added ten people to the team. I remember we had a social, I think last February or March, where we. The, we did a quiz and the quiz was all around how tall people were because half the people in the team we'd never met and so we literally <laughs> could do a quiz going who's taller this person or this person because you only saw them on Zoom yeah. and so 
because we'd had to we we had to onboard people pre prior to COVID, people turned up on their first day and half the time we'd forgotten they were starting. Like like I say, things are fast and we put these systems in place to try and make us organised and fast, but they haven't always been there. So before so now our associate director Marta had had a mid interview with her and she was a Spanish architect and she um, said that she was also a dog trainer and that was great because we had Wilf, uh, the, the office dog who used to whine a lot. It used to drive me insane. So I was like, okay, brilliant. Um, you start. When can you start? And she was like, I'm free tomorrow. I was like, okay, brilliant. You're starting tomorrow. So she turned up and I was like, ah, I forgot to get a laptop. So I was like, okay, bring your own laptop. You know, like this sort of total chaos, people turning up and you, you, nobody had got them a computer, nobody had got them a login. COVID happened and we were like, well, that that system of them turning off and asking to be onboarded isn't going to work anymore because yeah. they're, they're remote. So we got very, you know, we got very organised about it and we we would have like a, a little hamper that arrived and, and we it would get couriered to them. It had a laptop which was already set up. It was already on this kind of, you know, intranet thing that we built. So it had all these videos that we, we were recording videos on Zoom when we were onboarding people. And well, so we, were doing the, we were doing the Zoom uh, onboarding and then we realised we could just record it. And then save it for the next person. So there's this girl called Anna who works here now. And she's the face in all of the onboarding videos because we recorded them all with her. And so people think she's like a dummy when they get onboarded. Because now these <laughs> videos are still, we use, we use them. And anybody that turns up on their yeah. first day, they've already watched, you know, five hours of videos about how, to, how, how we work. So when they turn up and they realise that Anna's a real person, they're like, oh, wow. <laughs> we thought you were like just a, you know, kind of like an actor. Um, so so the, the actual production then of the content in the AL library, um, how was that produced? You just kind of outsourced it to people like Anna or you? No, it's you, mostly you Zoom stuff. So it's basically just like we, we do lunch and learn topics and right. then we just record it with the screen that we're using now. Got so it. we'll have a meeting in here, but then half the team are here, half the team are virtual joining on Zoom. And then we just press the record button. And then that's your the And then content. that then is a 30 minute or, you know, an hour thing that somebody can watch yeah. about, you know, if it's it's either about the software that we use or changes to legislation. Mm -hmm. the, the onboarding ones are just, you know, this is how the server works. This is, and it's one-to-one -one with the person who's teaching them. So right. I've done one on, you know, our design process. Nat, our head of operations, has done one on, you know, how you set the alarm and how you get on the <laughs> server and like, you know, really basic, you know, all the stuff that you need to know. And then more advanced stuff as to how we do resourcing, how we do profitability, timesheets, all of this stuff is just captured in these little Amazing. Zoom videos. And we expect, so we pay part of what we introduced again because we, because of COVID. We felt that um, people were working really hard and there was less control over people's hours. Um, and so we did an analysis of how much it would cost us if we paid everybody for every hour they worked, so paid overtime. Mm -hmm. uh, and we realised it was a cost that we could justify, and so we now have paid overtime, so every hour you work, you're paid for, and that includes the onboarding. So we expect everybody, when they st turn off on their first day, they've already worked eight hours for us, and that's all paid. <clears throat> it's paid overtime before they start, so that when they start, they hit the ground running. Um, and that's been really good. And it also, it weeds out people, if you tell people in the interview, oh, by the way, <clears throat> when you turn up, I wouldn't want you to have already worked a day. Um, we only really want people that are quite committed to us to, to, to bother applying. So you kind of work out. If somebody goes, ooh, you know, I don't, that's a bit, yeah. it seems a bit much. You go, okay, well, I don't think we're going to be right for each other because I'm going to ask you to do lots of other things and I want you yeah. to do them because I want you to be passionate about working here. Brilliant, brilliant. I love that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about your sales and marketing, because obviously, you know, the, the growth that you've experienced, I, I'm imagining that sales and marketing, and you mentioned at the beginning that you use the word sales, which is already an unusual thing for an architect to be talking about, where oft, architects are often famously in denial about being salespeople. Um, what sorts of skills or processes have you implemented both on marketing and on the kind of you know, conversational negotiations that you have with your commercial clients? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, I think the first thing to say is that, yeah, sales is sort of a verb and a noun, isn't it? But, like, for us, it took quite a long time for us to understand the difference between sales and revenue right. um, and track both, and they're completely independent of one another. Like, they're not... They're correlated, but they're different. So we track our sales, and the sales is when... So if you said... If you turn up and you say, hi, I'm a developer, and I want I want to employ you to design a gallery, um, and it's going to cost 10 million to build or whatever, and we go, okay, well, our, our fees are going to be £200,000, 
that sale, £200,000, when you sign on the dotted line, that will get registered as a sale for January if it happened today. Yeah. But the revenue would be over the next 12 months, say. So then it would be, you know, divided down 10 grand a month, or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and it took ages for us to understand the difference. And this is stuff where Mads was like, how do you not know this? I mean, this is really obvious. But like, no one teaches you at architecture school. Yeah, and, yeah. And so, it, like, the first thing, anything you want to improve at, you've got to track. Right, that's the fundamental thing. And so we track everything now. So the revenue is tracked, obviously. We want to try and build the revenue. But you know that if you're not tracking your sales and you're not, if your sales aren't going up, your revenue is not going to go up. And you see, you know, you see nice correlations last year where sales in March 2020, so the year before, sales just plummeted, obviously, yeah. because of COVID, because no one was confident enough to uh, want to commit to stuff. But actually, our revenue didn't go down that much because we sort of had stuff that was already that in, kept in the going. Pipeline. And yeah. yeah, and then we, we were quite fast to pivot and start offering alternative things. So because we were so involved in virtual reality and um, being able to do kind of virtual walkthroughs, we sort of started at, you know marketing new elements. So, you know, some of that, it, it's like, I suppose we're, we're agile and, and that helps with our marketing. If we see an opportunity, then we will like our... Our North Stars are consistent. We mm-hmm. want to build, you know, the cities of the future that are designed around humans and human like experience. That never changes, but the stuff that we're able to sell can be kind of adapted quite quickly depending on what you have, you know, what, what situations arise, such as COVID. We're like shit, we we'll yeah. sell some different stuff because people aren't committing to architecture. Um, your question was totally different. Is what I, I think our, our marketing. We don't do a lot of marketing. We instead invest quite a lot of money on relationship building. Right. Um, so we've always done that. We've, you know, it, we've, we've invested lots in people to teach us about this. So we've had you know, various different people that have kind of advised us on our marketing and, and sales strategy. And so lots of us are around events. So pre-COVID, we did and we're bringing this back this year, once every six weeks we'll do a roundtable breakfast mm-hmm. um, where we'll invite a couple of people that are our existing clients who are going to say nice things about us, a few people that we've never met, and then a few hunting partners. So those are consultants who we work with, so a planning consultant, say, um, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to think who, who else. And, and then we'll try and get, like, a, a keynote speaker. So um, we've had the mayor of Hackney, we've had the head of regeneration at um, Redbridge, um, we've had uh, Jonathan Martin, head of um, Inward Investment at Walton Forest. And so developers want to come because you've got somebody from a local authority speaking um, and that, you know, that then establishes a relationship with them. So there's a few people there that know us already and they will continue to book work with us and say nice things about us. And then the, the three or four other developers that are in the room will go, oh, wow, these guys, they've got a couple of developers here who give them credibility. They've got a key, keynote speaker from a local authority that I want to be involved with. We've obviously done ones with Mo Butt, who's leader of Brent. You know, big names in a in a relative sense. Local authority is very important to, to architects um, and developers. So, so the getting getting that gets developers in the room establishes the start of a relationship, and then we track everything as you, you'd expect in a CRM. So we use PipeDrive. So as soon as a person comes to an event, they'll be will be added to our, our CRM database, and then we'll add information mm-hmm. and, and remind ourselves to catch up with them. Um, so, you know, our funnel is you come to an event, you understand, you, you know a bit about who we are. We'll then try and follow up <clears throat> and ideally try and get um, somebody to send through a site. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not one of these people that says architects shouldn't do free work. It's like people spend money on advertising and marketing all the time. This is just the way that we should spend our money mm-hmm. for, for us. Yeah. We should spend money on providing a little tidbit of the service that you're going to be providing at the end so if somebody sends me a feasibility study I was up till midnight this is year seven I was up till midnight last night doing one you know because somebody sent me a site and it's somebody that I want to work with and they said oh we need it by Friday and I was quite busy all week so I ended up sitting up last night till midnight watching Moneyball and doing a, a, a capacity study for a you know what was it 150 unit scheme um, and we turn those around quickly we make them look good and they're free and, you know, ideally then we, we get the, we also show that client, we go, well, look, this is a capacity study, but also this is a planning application of a similar size right. that we've done recently. And if you want to come into the office and test out the VR, we can show you what it's going to be like to work with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's our sales pipeline, you know, and it works pretty, pretty effectively. Great, great. And in, in, in terms of, you know, negotiating contracts and making sure that your fees are where you want them and that, and that clients are kind of adhering to 
the contract that you set out? How do you go through that process? Yeah, so two different. I mean, I'm I'm a hopeless negotiator. I think John's slightly better than me. I just want the job usually, and so you know, my mentality is we're in a growth phase of the business, um, and therefore we should be. You know, we price less than our company. The people that we're competing against now are sort of you know Patel Taylor, Sale, yeah. Farrells. Those are the names that we come up against, and we're going to cost less than them. I mean, the guys from a sale have told us that. Mm-hmm. They're like, you guys are ridiculously cheap. But, like, we know that we're doing that intentionally because it's the thing that we know that we can afford to do. Part of, part of paying everybody overtime means that we have probably the most accurate timesheets of any business because yeah. because we're pretty much the only people paying overtime. I think I just did an interview with the RIBA and they said they didn't know of any other company that was paying for every hour. But as a result, we know exactly how many hours people spend mm. on things. So our data set is really accurate in terms of our delivery. Yeah. So if you don't pay people overtime, you have no idea how much your team are subsidizing to get that, that document done. You just mm-hmm. have no idea. We know exactly because unless people are not wanting to get paid for all their hours, which I think is un- unrealistic, we have a complete data set of exactly how long it takes us to deliver stuff. And we know what our, mar- our profit margins are on that. And if we want to, we can reduce our profit. You know, our target profit margin is thirty percent. If we want to move move it down to fifteen or twenty because we want to win a job, yeah, we can do that. And we know exactly how to do that. So, so it um, all comes with very carefully monitored metrics. To yeah, be able yeah, to, yeah. To be able yeah. To play. And that helps with negotiation because so somebody came to us recently. We we're doing an amazing project. And, you know, and he said, "What are your fees for this?" And we said, two hundred grand." And he said, "Well, I'm not going to give you two hundred grand. I'll give you a hundred grand." And we that's all I can afford. And we said, "That's fine." We can do it for 100 grand because we know our cost base, but we want a 100 grand kicker when we get consent. And he went, yeah, works for me, works for us. Great, so you just kind of postponed part of that yeah. fee or you're, yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. being I mean, flexible yeah, with the... Obviously, if we don't get consent, it'll be uh, you know, terrible. Yeah, but, but you're taking the risk on... We're taking the risk and we know that we can deliver it for that. We can, we can do it for 100 grand and have some profit, but yeah. the profit's going to be between 5 and 10%. But then if the kicker then comes in then obviously your profit margin is much higher, yeah. you know, subject to, to getting consent. Um, so that was, that's the negotiation bit. And what was the other thing you said? You, also, you had a second bit of your question, which I've forgotten. Well, um, actually, going, going back to what you were saying about when you're winning work and you're, and you're doing free work. Now, this is obviously a kind of, can be a contentious issue. And, and it's not free work, it's marketing. Okay. That's how I see it. Yeah. Because we have a budget for marketing. It's, it's business development. When, when would you say it's, it is free work? And because this is interesting because we a lot of, I mean, I was interested, I was in Farrell's office not so long ago and they were using a very similar sort of strategy to, mm-hmm. to, be, to be winning work and when they're, when they're negotiating with, with, well, de- with I, developers. From what I've heard, Farrell's will go further and they would actually do a planning. Farrell's, I'd imagine, and I don't know, have a decent war chest of cash, which us as a growing business, we don't. We're, you know, cash right. flow is always our concern. So we can't, we can't afford to do so. I think at Farrell's, I've, I've heard, and you know, obviously don't want to be spreading rumours, but I've heard that they will do a planning application at, at zero cost, and it's all in the kicker, it's all on, all on consent, which is amazing for a developer, and probably amazing for them, because I'd imagine they could charge a premium for that. And, right. and, but they're probably sitting on a few million quid in the, in the bank, which, um, you know, when we're doing that, we'll take that decision as well. And I, there's a few other companies that I've heard will, will do the same. You know, I, I would do I'd do that if, if we had if we were sat on a war chest as well. I think yeah. you know, you've got to be smart about how you work with developers. Developers, ha, you know, they, they don't they don't always have a lot of their own cash sitting around, but they've got once you get the consent, they've got access to draw it down. So mm-hmm. if you're smart about it, you can charge more. You're effectively, you know, sharing the risk and, and, and sharing the upside. I've got I've got no issue with doing that. Yeah, if you can afford to. So when when you're um, building relationships and you say the, the round tables that you've you, you developed, that sounds like quite a powerful way of curating, you know, a group of experts and also positioning yourself as a leader or thought leader in in that particular domain. Um, how do you continue to nurture those relationships? Because sometimes, obviously, if you're talking with developers, there might be not, not be a project for a little a little while longer or. What's yeah, the, what's the, and, and, there's quite and, a few names on our CRM where I continuously invite them to events and I never get mm-hmm. I never get anything from them. I think I've got a patience of about 12 months and then after that I get like this rage inside me and they get scrapped <laughs> and they get taken off because they're just taking the piss. Um, so, you know, I don't know. The ones that c- continue to have a f- free breakfast from us and never book any work with us get taken off the list and the <laughs> ones that don't become our clients. And once they're our clients... We're pretty, we're pretty, um, pretty nurturing to our clients. I think you know we, we want to always. The main thing is make do a good job and get consent for them and deliver because that's really what they care about. Mm. You know we we 
take people to lots of events and, and we'll, they'll be they'll move from being on the you know being invited to the round table as a as a prospect to being invited to the round table as a client and, yeah. and that's that's how we nurture them you know they'll get exposure to whatever keynote speaker it is that we've decided to to, to you know for that day would be useful to them so that's how we, can, we use the events to keep that relationship going but mm-hmm. they're just sat on a different bit of the table where they're now advocating for us yeah yeah um you also mentioned as well about well with these round tables there's it's a group of advisors as well and you you you're talking about how you, you early on in the in the business you hired the the non-exec what other sorts of advisors have you used to grow the business pretty much all of them i think we've got and and, and business coaches and, and got... why don't you use architects for these things <laughs> <laughs> What and business advice? <laughs> well, I, well I, I'm saying that sort of jokingly because it, when I've spoken to many business consultants who work with architects, and they're always perplexed, and they say, "Why are architects putting an architect in charge of marketing, or putting and you know, architect?" Yeah, we don't. I don't. Yeah. I, architects. I look. You know, I sort of like architects because I am one. But yeah. other than that, I wouldn't use them for stuff that's not within their lane necessarily. I mean, mm-hmm. there's some amazing marketers who are architects, you know, Richard Rogers, just the, the prime example of smart guy, obviously amazing inspirational person, but mm. smart marketer, you know, he writes a book, which is his manifesto, which everybody buys and then reads, and then they go, oh my God, this guy really understands the future of cities. The Labour, you know, Blair government is like, this is our man. And because he just replanned London, cities for a small planet. And, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, it was marketing collateral. But people were buying it. Yeah, a smart guy, and and you know because it had an inspirational message. And I think as we've grown, uh, uh, na- like a, I think at the start, what we were comfortable saying was stuff that felt more salesy, was stuff that was like here's here's how you deliver value. Because ultimately, what developers want is to you know unlock the value of a site, and so that's what we were talking about. As we've grown, we've realised that. If you the gatekeepers of value are often the planners, and if you right. want to get if you, what you need to do to get the most value out of a site is to inspire the planners to come on a journey with you, mm-hmm. and it's not just the planners; it's the local authority, it's the you know the head of regen now because the projects are working on are bigger, and it's sometimes the leader of the council that you have to inspire. So this actually it's made us more confident with our marketing to to do what Richard Rogers said is like this is how we want the future to be. Jump on board with that vision, you know, uh, on this particular project. This is we want cities, of, you know, we want to design the cities of the future. Here's a whatever several hundred unit scheme in this borough. This is what we want. Our objectives are to make it sustainable, to make it an inspiring place to live, to, mm. make, to make it a creator of jobs, to make sure that the, the the development is anchored in a place, and that place is cemented through the jobs and the you know the sort of enjoyment that people get from that place. That's our vision, you know, and, and that's quite compelling to planners and, and, and that unlocks, even if it might cost the developer more, it unlocks the value of the site because you are able to inspire people yeah. to get more out of that site. So that's sort of our, you know, our message has evolved um, to be, I suppose, almost more targeted towards the decision makers at the local authority than it is to, to the developers because that's the way the value will flow. It will be unlocked by the people at the local authority. That's really interesting. How, how do you communicate that to, say, your developer clients so that they know that that's where they're getting a lot of value? Well, how do you, how do you, how do you communicate this, the value that you're bringing to your, your commercial clients in a, in a process like that, for example? Well, we just say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> you just flat out explain it. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I think, yes, that's, that's what we would... That's what we do. So I had a meeting yesterday where um, we we use every tool that's available to us to try and explain people to, to people that that's what we're doing. I, I think also we're um, again playing from the taking from the Rogers playbook. The politics of, of architecture is so important. So we spend mm. part of our marketing budget is doing free work. Part of our marketing budget is that we spend two, an amount of money a month on a political consultant um, who advises us but also um, kind of introduces us to people at local authorities who are key decision makers and so by investing in understanding how the politics of these things work it gives us an edge on our competition yeah because you're like how would you explain that well, we go here's Christian who's our advisor who is you know has contacts with the local authority and 
Christians, say a little bit about what they want. They want jobs, they want sustainable, they want... You go, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to deliver them a, a you know, a kind of... We're going to do like a pre-pre-app. We're going to, hope, you know, or a, a pre-app, and, and we're going to understand that this is what the local authority want the messaging to be around this development. And we just sit there with the developer and go, this is, this is what you want. You want lots of units, we understand that. But what the, what the, the local authority wants is they want jobs and, and, and you know, play space and, and amenity and uh, placemaking and, you know, a destination or whatever it is. And that's what we're going to do, okay? All, all on board, everyone on board, right, let's go. And that's, you know, that's, that's how we do it. So the politics of it is really important and it's really interesting. And I think, you know, um, once you understand, we're just such a small part of it, um, but what we should be doing is, is doing as much as we can to listen to what the local authorities yeah. are trying to achieve and then, and then telling the developer that that's what we're going to do and also give them the thing that they're trying to achieve. And, you know, that's the kind of the win-win. It's, it sounds like it's a very proactive process that you're engaged in, in in kind of actually finding out what the planners are after, kind of being involved in well, those conversations. The planners, the, you know, the leaders often, the planners, are, uh, you know, they, they are, what the planners want is, a, you know, a, a, a compliant scheme because that's the easiest one for them to process. But but often what you have, to, you know, I don't think I've ever worked on an po- entirely policy compliance scheme. Right. Really, it's about the vision um, and it's about trying to, you know, sell your vision to whoever the highest decision maker is at the local authority, which is often the leader of the council of the size of projects that we're working on. Have you ever considered other revenue streams into the business or is it for you, no, we want to keep it as a strict, you know, our fees come from design services? Is well, that... I think at the start, and it's one of Mads' good pieces of advice, we had, a, we, we, we had a real thing that we wanted to try and bring together what we felt was, and I still do feel is that the industry is this very sort of 20th century place where knowledge is siloed mm. and so as a young architect I remember going God, I don't really don't know how like the corner of plasterboard sort of meets like, the only person that really knows that isn't available when you're doing the detailing because it's like a subcontractor even the main contractor might not know specifically how this you know whatever shadow gap is going to be created there's a subcontractor who all they do is that but you don't have access when you're doing a stage four pack to that person. So we were like, well, this is stupid. We Aqua Lowry should be this place where we can bring it all together. So we set up a development company, an architecture company, and a construction company. And the construction company was awful. It was the worst <laughs> thing we've ever done. And we built one project and hated it, absolutely hated it. It's very hard if you don't have the, the leverage of like a continuing pipeline of well, construction right. projects to be able to negotiate well with the people that are going to be delivering it so subcontractors and so they were like well you're just some one-off architect you know what why should i bother pulling my guys off another job to to get your thing done Mm -hmm. so it was um we're very very open to the idea of trying anything um and and you know failing fast i suppose it it didn't fail but we didn't want to do it anymore yeah um and but yeah so the development company is still going we've got a site that we just acquired in harlow um hoping to achieve 40 units on that site um the architecture company so what yeah one of man's piece of advice was don't try and do it all at once right so we were trying to do this at the start and we've only really got into the development side this year because you know, after six years of trying to hone the architecture company to be efficient and mm-hmm. design good things, we felt at that moment we could look up a little bit and look at other opportunities for, um, you know, for development. Not going back to construction in a hurry there. <laughs> so the, the development company, can you tell us a little bit about this, how it's working? Is that something that's owned by Aquid Lowry or is it a completely separate entity? And It's a separate entity, but me and John own half of it with um, planning consultants who are our partners in the... It, well, it's a specifically a JV. Um, it's a single... The company that we've set up... For a specific a single, building. Single-purpose vehicle for one development opportunity which just arose because we were working in an area right. where we were then contacted by somebody who wanted to wanted to, their site to be acquired and so we put together this SPV with between mm-hmm. us and the planning consultant because... You know, we felt that we had a, a, an advantage there because we knew through our experience with the planners on the other side what we were likely to be able to achieve. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was, it was on at a good price. Um, we paid some money to have exclusivity so that we could do our background uh, and then um, completed about three months later. Um, and yes, yeah, exciting. Amazing. So is this something that's completely your private investment? It's all the funds that have, or profits that have come out of... Um, Aquid Lowry, or are you working with external in- investors or anything like that? Um, we just got a bridging loan, 
Right, so okay. It's our money plus a bridging loan. Um, so if we don't manage to achieve consent within two years, then you know, that will be problematic for us because we'll still have to pay back the <laughs> bridging loan. But we can extend it um, and we just have to service the interest. So um, Fantastic. So, so is this something you would like to see more of? And you could see like the development, com- you know, you're doing more and more of your own developments? I don't want to take our eye off the ball of what we're trying to achieve with the architecture business. Right. But, I mean, with this, you know, this opportunity arose, I'd imagine there'll be further opportunities that arise. So it came kind of, if, kind of organically. If, particularly if, you know, if, this, if there's some profit that comes out of it, yeah. in the, we would then reinvest that into another project. And I do think it's good to be able to say to a client, well, you know, I, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword because I think some developers are like, oh, you should be a bit careful of telling people that you're going to be a developer. Are you going to be co- competing with us? It was actually a conflict um, of interest. But I, I, you know, I see it the other way around where I say, I say to them, look, you know, if you, like, it's unlikely that you would have found this site and um, it's not necessarily in a place that anybody that we work with would want to work, but it works for us and, you um, it's good that we're putting our money where our mouth is. You know, mm. if we're going to be giving people advice about what they should be doing in terms of their planning strategy, their political engagement, their delivery, we should be able to be showing that we are able to do it as well. Is I it, think it's reassuring for a client that their architect knows how to be a developer. Is it, um, well, yeah, and I imagine it gives you a, a much stronger commercial intelligence so that you're able to align yourself with the sort of business agendas of, of, of your developer clients. It opens your eyes to the realities of, of it and it makes you go, oh, you know, do we really need that <laughs> flourish there? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Brilliant. In, in, in terms of um, hiring and building the team, how, what sorts of obstacles have you found with that uh, as a team? You know, and particularly now, I know hiring is, is it's such a pressure on companies at the moment. Um, yeah. What, so, so it's, again, sort of any any problem that we over, that we need to overcome, we tend to sort of approach it strategically. And we realised at the point last year where we were spending quite a lot of money on recruiters that it was going to be more cost effective for us to bring a recruiter in house. <laughs> and this is what I realised: like any business is really just a hiring. Any business that's growing is is a recruitment business. So any company needs to be a marketing business as well as an architecture business. And also, if you're growing, you need to be a recruitment business as well. And so we've got Stephen Drew, who actually is the person that introduced us. Yep. Um, so Stephen was a McDonald & Co. And, um, and uh, we were chatting and he recruited a couple of people for us. And then at the point where he decided that he wanted to leave um, McDonald & Co., we were there, you know, we were very, very happy to, to bring him on board. And Smart he's done move. a fantastic job. Um, and, you know, it only takes a few recruits before the amount of money that you can pay somebody's salary is going to be equivalent to just yeah. one or two hires for the year. And so also he's quite, he's quite an innovator in recruitment is, himself. Yeah, yeah, so, so we got on really well and, you know, we continue to. And I think he's in today, actually. He's not, he's not in every day because his recruitment voice is too loud for our office. <laughs> when he's in full recruitment mode, he has to be in South London so that we don't hear him. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Brilliant. And what, what kind of process do you put people through to, you know, bef- you know, to, to select them? It's a good question, good question. So I think um, part of what I like to do, I do a lot of the recruitment myself, uh, not for the, as much now for kind of, for like part twos and stuff, I think we, we let our associates do a lot of that hiring um, mm-hmm. and they, I'm sure, have their own processes where so they're probably a bit nicer. But I, I, like, I like to try and challenge people a little bit, often by doing stuff quite quickly and seeing what happens. So I like to offer people jobs. If I like somebody, I'll just offer them a job halfway through the interview mm-hmm. to see what happens. Because like some of our best hires, like I was saying to Marta, you know, where, with Marta, sorry, where where um, I offered her the job on the, on the spot, and I've done that to a few other people, and I like it. You know, those people that say yes and, and then just come in the next day, ready make to it work, happen. Yeah, they're the type of people that we really like to work with. So, um, but we for more senior roles, we've got quite a uh, extensive procedure. We well. There's a couple of things. One, strategically, we want to really recruit people at, at the lower level. Like, you know, I really want to recruit part ones and part twos only. If I had my way, that's all we'd ever do because we've put in place this education system basically so that we can be like the kind of the IAX or... Mm-hmm. Have you watched the Alec, Alex Ferguson documentary? No, I've read, it's amazing. I've read his book though. The he gets, he gets the job and the first thing, you know, he's got all of his notes still and he's like, if we want to win the title, you know, we can't buy the most expensive players, but we can make them. And he sets up the Man U Academy and within four years, he's created Paul Scholes, Gary Neville, Phil Neville, David Beckham, Ryan Giggs. You know, it's yeah. insane. Like, so the RAL Academy, the, is the, the point is that we want to 
I want to create the new, you know, Ryan Gigs of architecture. Uh, that's love what it's there it. for. And so we only it. really want to recruit people at the bottom. If our strategy is working perfectly and our growth is managed properly, we'll only recruit at kind of part one, part two level and then bring everybody through the ranks. Yeah. Um, obviously, that doesn't necessarily work all the time. So we've just recruited um, an associate. And with the senior hires, we because it's, if you can get everybody through from part two up to associate director, um, which is the plan, uh, you don't need, to, you know, everybody will already have your values and your instincts and your, your sort of way of working embedded. Um, but with, with, you know, a senior hire, it's, it's, it's hard for them to get used to the pace as well. So um, our interview process is, you know, we do two or three interviews and we actually bring in other um, consultants that we work with. So the person that I recently hired, um, I made them interview with the uh, planning consultant as well, but who's our JV partner in the in the, the deal? Because I wanted to yeah. understand if, if they knew enough planning to be able to, you know, uh, manage the, the size of projects that we're we're going <coughs> we're <coughs> working on at the moment. So it's not just us. We try and make sure other people's views are. Do, do you have well. do you have quite a, a refined process then for performance reviews and kind of nurture and you know once people are, are kind of employed and you're able to set out quite clear career paths for people. Yeah, so we're trying to make it more and more transparent. We did a staff survey last year, um, which Stephen Drew did for us. So it was like a kind of hundred questions or so. Um, mail, he did like a survey monkey thing, and then we compiled the results and, and we performed. We thought we performed pretty well in most of the areas. One one where we found that we did and this you know it comes back to this point you don't improve without measuring so we wanted to measure if we were being good at, at this um at all of these elements but the one around career, career progression um was one where we scored quite we scored a bit lower so um people this was sort of before you know before the AL academy was like really up, up, operational it was sort of, we were just growing it at the time but even with that i think what you need to know is what the rung is above you and what you need to do to get there and and you know, from the survey information, we found that that was an area where we needed to improve. Mm. So since then, we've set out like a much clearer matrix matrix of, of what, from where you start to where you end, what your responsibilities and um, tasks will be at those at every stage. Um, so, you know, it's something that we're working on uh, and trying to make clearer. We've actually sort of taken the job titles off as well um, from that kind of ladder because... I have no problem with having an associate director who's not a qualified architect because, like, you know, it, for me it's not that relevant as long as they're doing the task. Yeah. So we've got, you know, an amazing um, employee, uh, Natalie, whose dad's an architect, but she studied graphic design. Mm-hmm. And she has always known how to use um, the software that we use because she was helping her dad out at work. And so, what an amazing combination. Like, the documents, the design and access documents that Natalie produces are the best in the company because it's a graphic designer who knows how to use all of our architectural software. She then works with, you know, <coughs> works with the architectural assistants and, you know, <coughs> she'll be able to be an associate easily even though she's not got an architectural degree yeah. because she's just, like, you know, as long as there's a team surrounding her who are qualified mm. to, and she's mostly kind of working on planning stuff, um, she's going to be a really effective member of staff. So she will be able to move through the the, the, the grades, if you like, Got it. without having to be a qualified architect, because there's no there's just no need for her now to go back and be a qualified architect. What, what, what's the kind of overall company structure like at the moment in terms of, you know, your production team, and then what are the other sorts of support teams that you have developing? Um, so, well, we've got four associate, well, we've got one associate, three associate directors, sorry, other way around, three associates, one associate director, uh, and then a series of project architects, um, and assistance below them and then we've got an operations team so that's got um, includes our head of finance our head of operations and then the marketing is sort of an offshoot of that which is done mostly with um, external kind of right. subcontractors so we've got a person that writes press releases a okay. person does the website so um, you know it's mostly that and then we've got on the political on the advisory side there's kind of another then team of advisors so we've got the non-exec and we've got our political consultant and how did you and John then establish leadership roles? Like, what? Did, how did you know who's responsible for what? And has that ever been a conflict? And you know, what's what's the what's your secret for making that relationship work? Um, like anything, I think you got to invest in it. So, um, what there was some some stuff that sort of organically grew out of our person, slightly different personalities. Um, so John's and interests. 
I do more, I'm sort of more what do or at the start did more of the sales stuff and John did more of the kind of number stuff. Now we don't do the number stuff ourselves, but John still has more of a sort of oversight of like mm-hmm. the running of the you know the sort of I don't know the, the accounts and that that element of sort of um, I don't know how to describe it without making it like you know that sort of oversight of the, the real like the engine of the machine that actually is pumping the money through the business. Yeah. Uh, and I've got more of an oversight of the kind of the marketing outputs and the um, kind of you know the delivery targets, the events, stuff like that. That's going to be the stuff that gets him outwardly. That's mm-hmm. that's sort of my responsibility. But that um, but we both then have to share this sort of you know kind of uh, creative direction, which is at the heart of the business. Uh, and that's yeah, it's hard because you can tend to cross brief and, and you can tend to, you know, we're both kind of running projects and sometimes we have people that are working for both of us and it can be confusing for them. And so we, you know, we've spent time trying to listen to what people say. Like yep. at the start, I think that was a real criticism was that I'd ask somebody to do something and then John would come along and ask them to do something and there's like only a certain amount of hours in the day. Um, so we've done lots of 360 reviews and stuff surveys to try and understand where these pain points are and then address them. Uh, and that will be a continual process. But we've also got, you know, we've got business coaches. So we've got, Okay, you know, a few different. We've had tons of business coaches, but uh, the, the my favourite one was um, the guy uh, who runs, who's started uh, Lucky Voice, the karaoke bar. Uh, I know Nick um, Thistleton. I know Nick. Yeah, he's cool. He was f- so funny. So he was really good, um, and like we did loads of really productive work. And then one day, um, it was I think it was the last session or maybe the second last session that we'd prepaid for. Um, me and John had such a massive argument that we ended up like just storming out of the office. He was Nick was going, "Is this still useful?" And we were like, "Yes!" <laughs> just shouting at each other. And I think like that we just like left in a real strop. And like me and John then had a hug. And I think Nick was like shocked. And we, and we never, we never really, we never went back. <laughs> but no. So now we've got um, the co- co- coaches on the couch. If you know that podcast, yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we did uh, the step up program with with them with actually with our senior team as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really good. And we then got a business coach called Mark Lesser, um, John and I, who is like a sort of you know couples counselling for, for business people, if you like. So amazing. Got to invest in these relationships. Brilliant. And in terms of of, of leadership, and you, know, you, you get to a really interesting point in the in the business where there's you know it's it's a it's a quite a large team for an architectural practice, if you like. Um, what sorts of things are you now working on in your leadership? And also, in terms of transparency, how do you enroll the team into the vision of where the business is going? What sorts of mechanisms have you got in place for, yeah, for doing that? Really good question. So again, this is something that's very prescient. Like this is exactly what we're doing at the moment. So it's sort of gone from over the past two years being re- reasonably flat with me and John sort of just saying, do this, do this, do this. And you know that doesn't work when you get above 20. So bringing in that senior management team of associates um, has been, you know, it's with anything, it's it's, it's a learning process. So mm-hmm. I'm sure there's lots of stuff that I will do that will fr- constantly frustrate them where we might overrule or, you know, undermine. Um, but working on that, trying to listen to what they're saying about how that makes them feel and, and work with them to make sure that they are empowered to be able to then control the team below them yeah. um, is something that we're working on quite a lot. And then in terms of setting the vision, I think, you know, the, the most important thing that we've, we've set this that we've sort of stated this year is our our three challenges for this year. Um, if we want to be winning these really you know city scale projects uh, and also working at pace comfortably, we need that message that we were talking about before. This message of you know the vision of what the future mm-hmm. of cities to be like. We need that to be heard outwardly, but then also heard inwardly, uh, so that everybody is on the same page. We so we're writing a manifesto with a guy called Steve Smith, who's um, uh, sort of master planning background, but he he. Um, he, he writes a lot, he's sort of master, master plans through writing and he's helping us on a kind of manifesto. So we've got the staff handbook and manifesto documents quite intertwined and they're going to set the sort of the direction of the business outwardly for the manifesto and then inwardly for the staff handbook and they need to be linked and, and, and that's how we want to get people to, you know, to share with us the vision and then be able to enact it in their own way. Mm. So it's a North Star that allows them to, to sort of, you know, interpret it in their own way. Do, do you share um, kind of profit and loss with the with the team? Are, are people involved in the numbers at all, or like, did that? What sorts of metrics or optics so we're very, do you share? We're very open with the, with the senior team about um, the revenue and the profit because we that's how we resource. So yeah, you know, we resource from the money coming in. So it's, we've always been very transparent about yeah, what you know, we we have a big Excel spreadsheet or had now it's the CMAP, but um, which just shows all that you know. I mean, we we don't have any anything hidden from the senior team, um, and. 
you know, we want to pay people well. I think uh, we pay overtime. We, we, we were trying to get everybody salary so that at the top end of the river scale um, doesn't happen overnight. We give bonuses. We don't have any profit sharing mechanisms. Most of the profit gets reinvent, reinvested in yeah. the business. You know, we don't, if it, like I said, if we were sitting on a couple of million quid, it'd be different, but we're not. We Everything everything we spend, we reinvest. Uh, everything we earn, we, we reinvest. We want to grow the business, so we have to. Brilliant. What's next? What's What's the plans for 2022? 2022, like larger city scale projects, um, they're, the, they're the, the, the thing that we really want to focus on. We want to really start pushing um, net zero master planning as a kind of process. So like I said before, like the building rigs are going to come and push every architect, even if you were unwilling, even if you wanted to burn the planet down. The building rigs are really kind of pushing for each building to operationally kind of have... Uh, you know, a relatively low level of carbon in its, mm. in its operation. You, you, you then got embodied energy, which is a very difficult one to deal with, but, you know, is, is, is something that we want to think about. But if, if you're thinking bigger, you go, well, how do you, you know, transport is this massive non-operational, it's not being considered in the operation of the building in terms of how it's assessed. So you can have a net zero building that's in the middle of the countryside and everybody has to drive to. That's obviously not really, when you're thinking about it, going to be holistically kind of yeah. a, a low, low carbon building. So um, net zero master planning, really exciting thing that we want to start pushing. So just trying to make sure where you're doing a, a big master plan that you've thought about, you know, how, how can you make a 15 minute city within this little microcosm that you're designing? Make sure there's 